Well, good day that everybody and welcome. Thank you so much for joining us for our DOPS Autumn Update meeting. This is uh, timed around the time of, of the ASN uh, annual meeting and, and looking forward to that day, perhaps uh, as early as next year when, when we can do this again in person. Uh, but until then, we really have a, a packed agenda today. And so, so really looking forward to the three hours that we have together. Uh, next slide, please. All right, this is such an important, uh, such an important time for us, uh, at really a time of celebrate, celebration that at, as 2021 is our uh, 25th year of the DOPS, uh, the DOPS. And we're just uh, so thrilled. I've, it's just been a tremendous honor, privilege to work with everybody uh, over this, uh, over the course of this, um, this time frame um, to bring, to bring, uh, bring uh, the DOPS, uh, it, it, to bring forward the work that we've done and, and, and all the really, really good work that so, so many folks have, have, uh, have contributed to over these years. Uh, next slide, please. Yeah, and thanks again to our investigators, our consortium sponsors, uh, especially to our site investigators, coordinators and study patients who really worked uh, tirelessly and given tirelessly to help uh, make this study a, a, a success that it is. Next slide. All right, and many thanks as well to our consortium sponsors. It really is through partnerships with folks such as you that really that really allows us to do the good work that we do. We're, we're so, so appreciative for your support and partnership. Thank you. Next slide. All right, well, it really does uh, uh, take a village. Uh, we are uh, now in 20 countries, 775 active clinical sites and 34,000 patients uh, across our three uh, studies within the program, our HEMA adopts uh, uh, PDOPS and CKDOPS, and each of those three studies have, um, have, have time set aside today to review their, their, their research and, and exciting new developments. Next slide. And just to remind folks here, from the very, very start, when Fritz, Ron, and others uh, launched this study, um, th these goals uh, really stand very much unaltered, that is to to capture and describe real world practice variation. But, and we do so with a random, uh, a stratified random national sample of, of participating sites, either dialysis units or now advanced CKD uh, clinics. And importantly, not only do we identify um, um, variation in practice, we spend a lot of time focused on identifying optimal practices and in turn uh, providing lessons to the community about ways that we can improve care. And actually, I, I have the fortune of talking, uh, giving a talk next week at ASN, where I will review um, the actually really pretty remarkable progress in hemodialysis mortality over um, over the last 25 years. And um, actually, I'll be, I'll be leveraging work that that our biostatistician Keith McCullough has done, um, uh, but talk identifying some key practices that have improved over time. Uh, and they really have impacted uh, uh, survival and helped improve survival. So, so uh, yeah, pl please take a listen to that to that talk uh, at ASN. And then, and then um, this is a slide showing our our publication record. We don't show this at every uh, at every event like this uh, anymore, um, but we put this together just this week, and I, we're, we're pleased to see that we're, we have uh, as many uh, publications as we do. Um, this year already. So that's a way of saying that folks are just so, so active uh, and all the work that people are putting into the study really does lead to important uh, research output. Uh, we see we have uh, well over 20 publications uh, so far um, this year. All right, next slide. Right, and the third, by the way, the third goal of the DOPS program is to uh, serve as a resource for the community. And this is incredibly important. Um, and we, I, I still feel that we, there's much more, or is more that we can do in this regard. We just have um, the, the, so much data and so much to work with, and we really benefit from input from others. Well, I was gonna note that one really important collaboration with the community uh, is our partnership with the International Society of Nephrology, uh, which really uh, ramped up this year. And many thanks to Roberto Coafijo, who's a, a, a DOPS investigator and, um, and a leader of the, uh, ISN uh, educational initiatives. And thanks as well to the ISN leadership for helping support this collaboration. Here's a slide showing a number of webinars and video abstracts that we put on uh, through ISN Academy and that are available on the web. And next slide. 
Right, and just actually, uh, just very recently, uh, I, along with Prince Port and, and uh, oh, sorry, before getting there, this is a, a, um, a, a survey that, that we put together with the ISN looking at COVID and COVID care. We have an excellent uh, presentation in this regard from, uh, from Elliot Tanner uh, uh, later in this, in this uh, presentation, which actually will focus on lower middle income countries. And here's what, what I was uh, just getting to, actually, uh, I, as well as Ron Pazzoni and Prince Port, um, uh, 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 were part of a podcast that Roberto led. Uh, we were actually celebrating uh, the achievements of DOPS over 25 years. And you know, please take a listen. This is available through the through the ISN uh, uh, website and, and podcast platforms. So I actually should be a really good listen, and you hear some nice, great stories from Fritz and Ron about DOPS in the in the early days. So so that was actually really fun to put together. Uh, next slide. All right, we're, we're busy at ASN. I think this is a total of 14 abstracts. Um, next slide. Also, we have uh, Ron is, is speaking at, at a symposium on paritis, uh, and I, as well as uh, London Golestina, will speak at a DOP slash USRDS symposium. I would note actually that Fritz Port is the moderator of that session, and he's the perfect person to moderate this session, uh, talking about the OGs of big data, which my daughter's reminding me uh, means the originals. Of, uh, of big data, but, but of course, Fritz uh, launched both the USRDS and, and the DOPS as well. So, uh, so kudos uh, to, to Fritz, uh, and please take a listen to the symposium uh, in, a, in in one week uh, at ASF. Next slide. And uh, as noted today, we've just got a chock full agenda. Um, we are going to have a, a sessions on DOPS and then PDOPS, uh, or IS, ISN uh, DOPS COVID survey, and a CK DOPS session as well. Um, now, for each of these, we have um, one advantage to, to doing this uh, remotely by webinars that we is that we do have pre-recorded talks, and we do have time in most of those sessions for interface afterwards. So, chat, so chat, um, uh, and discussion. Please do use the chat function with any questions that you may have or ideas that you may have as well, even beyond the talks that you see. Ideas that you might have for new questions, uh, for for new research directions, and here's. Uh, uh, um, instructions on using the chat feature, which you all are probably familiar with after a year and a half of COVID uh, uh, at this point. And next slide. All right, well, actually the first session that we're gonna have today, we're actually really, really very excited about, um, um, before getting into the into the DOF study related sessions, we wanted to take a step back and see where we stand with the HIF pH inhibitors. Um, it's actually been two years uh, since HIF, uh, the pH inhibitors, Roxaduce, that uh, specifically were introduced in China, that were approved in China and then in Japan as well. So we have two years now of uh, being on the market there. Um, next slide, please. Right, and these are data from our DOP study. This is in-center hemodialysis, and we're seeing roughly 4 to 5 percent uh, HIF pH inhibitor use in these two DOPS countries. Now, um, as folks may know, I mean, they, these are prevalent hemodialysis patients, so not necessarily the most likely group to, to first be using HIF pH inhibitors, uh, uh, as, as our, as our uh, panelists will speak to. So um, what we did with it, with this, we actually have about a half hour for this, uh, this segment. What we're, gonna, what we're gonna do is have um, short videos uh, from a couple, two of our panelists, uh, followed by a more open panel discussion. Um, uh, and, and once again, for folks on the line, we do we we do encourage you to submit uh, questions, comments um, um, through through the interactive uh, uh, medium. And with that said, let me introduce my first uh, speaker. And this is uh, the Professor uh, Masayama Nangaku. Uh, professor Nangaku is is um, um, is at the University of Tokyo and also adopts uh, J Dobbs Japan Dobbs country investigator and really well known in the HIP pH inhibitor space. So uh, we'll start with this uh, video from Dr. Nangaku. Hello, this is Masaomi Nangaku from the University of Tokyo. I am going to talk about current status of HIF pH inhibitors in Japan today. This is disclosure of my COI. HIF pH inhibitors were developed on the discovery of the Nobel Prize. Roxadastat was the first drug approved in Japan 
on September 2019. Broxar Stat came into the market on November 2019, followed by Dapro Stat and Vadar Stat, which were approved on June 2020. Enard Stat was approved on September 2020, and Molid Stat was approved at the beginning of this year. We performed clinical trials of HIF pH inhibitors in Japan. The product was effective in non dialysis dependent CKD patients, HD patients, and PD patients in Japan. Vadadastat was also effective both in non dialysis dependent CKD patients and dialysis dependent CKD patients. Another stat was also effective, and we published the long term observation of the phase three clinical trial. Of note, we did not observe serious adverse events in these clinical trials. This is the post marketing survey of Roxadostat performed uh, for half a year from uh, November 2019. The most often observed uh, adverse event was gastrointestinal disorder. This is a table of adverse events of specific interest. As you can see, only one case of hyperkalemia, two cases of cancer, and one case of retinal hemorrhage were reported. The cases of thrombosis embolism related events were 84. PMDA, our regulatory agency, required a description of warning about thrombosis embolism in the package insert of all HIF pH inhibitors in Japan. This is the post marketing survey of the product two cases of retina related adverse events, four cases of cancer related events and six cases of thrombosis embolism related events were reported here. This is the post-marketing survey of Vadadastat. There was no report about retina related adverse events, one case of neoplasm, and three cases of thrombosis embolism related events were reported. Because HIF pH inhibitors were first approved in China and Japan, it is the important mission of the APSN to deliver uh, the information accurately to the world. So we published recommendation of proper use of HIF pH inhibitors. Let's talk about the cost. The Japanese government decided that the cost should not be a factor uh, that decides the choice between ESA and HIF pH inhibitors. So they made a cost of uh, ESA and HIF pH inhibitors almost equal. In Japan, the cost of drugs for HD patients are bundled. However, oral drugs are out of the bundle. Only injection drugs are bundled. Theoretically, as HIF pH inhibitors are per oral drug, uh, that is out of the bundle. In that case, doctors may prescribe HIF pH inhibitors based on the economic reason. So the Japanese government decided to change the rule. If one wants to include the HIF pH inhibitors in the bundle, as ESA, they reimburse more. If one wants to prescribe uh, if pH inhibitors out of the bundle, they decrease the reimbursement. If pH inhibitors are slowly replacing ESAs in Japan. The speed is not fast because uh, Japanese doctors are replacing ESA with HIF pH inhibitors deliberately. Thank you for your attention. 
Okay, yeah, Professor Nangaku, thanks. Thank you so much for that uh, that introduction. So interesting uh, uh, to note, first of all, that there were five EPH inhibitors uh, on the market and available in Japan. Um, number two, to see the safety uh, data that, that you reviewed briefly, uh, and also to hear the, the 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 movements with respect to cost and sort of neutralizing it, as it were, any cost incentive uh, for or against prescription. Uh, Anyway, much more to talk about. Uh, our, our next our next uh, speaker is uh, Professor uh, um, uh, Lee Zhuo, uh, and uh, Lee is at uh, is a, a good friend of ours uh, and adopts uh, China country investigators from Beijing uh, at Peking University People's Hospital. Thank you, uh, Professor Zhuo. Dear colleagues, I'm happy to have the opportunity to share real-world experience in HIV PHI use in China mainland. As you know, because HIV PHI have multi ways in promote red blood cell production, it is um, it is hoped that can it's better than ESA in renal anemia management. So you know the drug was validated in non-dialytic patients and dialytic dependent CKD patients and is marketed in the year 2018 as class 1.1 new drug. This drug was covered by national medical insurance in the last year in 2019. And some patients with renal anemia changed gradually from ESA to Roxadasta. And Roxadasta was more favorable in non dilated patients and peritoneal dilated patients. It is estimated that around 60 to 70 percent newly diagnosed patients started Roxadasta after initial assessment. But most hemo patients was reluctant to change from ESA to Roxadasta because it is easy to use ESA intravenously or subcutaneously by our nurses during dialysis sessions. Um, but uh, most ESA non responders non-dialytic or dialytic dependent, they have to change to Roxadasta. And when they change to Roxadasta, most of them respond well to Roxadasta and uh, reach their hemoglobin target. Uh, as you know, DOPS were performed in China major cities, including Beijing, Shanghai, and Guangzhou. So after national medical insurance covered in the 1920, uh, 19, uh, 2019 November, we see that the percent of uh, hemo patients who are using Roxadasta increased gradually and reached the uh, 5% in May this year. And in my center, the percent of patients who are using Roxadasta is about 50% in hemo patients and 70% in uh, peritoneal dialysis patients. We know that uh, we, we, I want, uh, also want to share that uh, some new HPHI uh, is under registration trial in China. We see here some are in phase three, some in one in phase two, and the most of them in phase one clinical trials. I hope uh, this new HPHI drug, when they market it, can uh, add new drugs for our doctors to use to treat anemia. And uh, uh, during the usage of clinical uh, of uh, Roxadasta, doctors have some feelings when using this drug. And some of the drugs was under clinical trials and some need to be uh, some uh, need to be validated to design new trials. The first is that those of Roxadasta is closely related to CKD stage in non dialytic and dialytic patients with residual, residual renal function. And the initial dose of Roxadasta is lower than the recommended doses. ESA non responders may respond well to Roxadasta. Attitude may influence the efficacy of Roxadasta, and the patient who live in a high attitude may le need least dose. ORI supplement may be efficient after change from ESA to Roxadasta in some hemo patients with stable hemoglobin. And after patient change from ESA to Roxadasta, we see good blood pressure response. And Roxadasta may increase the sensitivity of ESA. All these are doctors' feelings when using this drug. And uh, 
some of these feelings are under clinical trial to be validated. Now let's see the first, what is the proper dose of Raksadasta when changing from Nisa to Raksadasta? Or when Raksadasta is the first renal anemia treatment patient? Uh, drugs. And the second is, can Raksadasta be used to increase ESA sensitivity? And th uh, this needs to be a new, new trial to validate. Now, what is the influence of degree of inflammation on Raksadasta efficacy through this ongoing trial? And does Raksadasta have least impact on blood pressure compared with ISA? The observational studies say yes, and uh, uh, further uh, controlled trial need to be conducted to validate. Now, what is the target of AN stereo in Raksadasta treated patients? This study need to be designed and conducted. And does Raksadasta increase duodenal iron reabsorption? So this study is completed and data is under analysis. And does Raksadasta have any impact on red blood cell lifespan? So this study is published recently, maybe last month. And does Raksadasta slow the progression of CKD? So this study need to be designed and conducted. And does Raksadasta decrease cardiovascular mortality because the in a previous study, the polled analysis or published data gave confusing, confusing result. I think that uh, a randomized trial need to be conducted to validate, uh, to further investigate this question. And does long-term use of Roxadasta do good or do harm to our patients? Uh, I mean, the mortality uh, and uh, life, uh, quality of life, because you know that Roxadasta can promote multi-gene, uh, act, act, can activate multi-genes. Uh, uh, so this uh, question needs to be further addressed. So thank you for your attention. Yeah, Professor Jones, thank you so much. All right, uh, lots of interesting material there. First of all, the uh, number of questions you identified that we still need to answer, but all, and also the, the the clinical experience today. Some really fascinating uh, uh, items that you brought up. Um, um, what we'll do right now is move over to our panel, um, and if folks could put on their their cameras on the panel, that would be wonderful. So, in addition to Professor uh, Zhou uh, and Nangaku, we have uh, uh, Roberto Pacuafio, um and also uh, Alex Cases uh, and uh, Professor Cho uh, as well. And the moment, there we go, good. Anyway, so uh, uh, Professor Cases is from University of Barcelona and Hospital Clinic at Barcelona in Spain, Dobbs Country Investigator uh, as well. Uh, Zhang Yi Cho uh, is at the Kyungpuk uh, National University Hospital in Daegu, uh, South Korea. And Roberto Pacuaz, a, a DOPS investigator uh, on our team, and has been very closely involved with, with hit, the hip page inhibitors uh, during uh, development. Um, what I'm going to, and it, this is important, um, uh, we brought these folks together because actually all of these countries, with the exception of the US, now have uh, approved uh, the hip page inhibitors with recent approvals in, in Korea and in Roxadustat in the European Union as well. A quite different story uh, with the FDA and the US uh, to date. What I'll ask is for just a couple minutes um, from, first of all, from Alex and then from uh, uh, Professor Cho, uh, with respect to sort of ex um, the expectation uh, for utilization of hip beach inhibitors as they come on market, uh, and any other sort of high level comments you might have. Um, Alex. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. yes. Oh, perfect. Well, uh, first of all, uh, I would like to uh, uh, thank uh, Bruce for the invitation. And uh, first, I, I would like to express my gratitude to the colleagues from countries in the European Union and UK who gave me the feedback of the situation of Roxadustat in their countries. Although Roxadustat was approved by the EMA in August 2021, the speed of expected uptake is expected not to be uniform. As far as I know, few countries uh, will, uh, like Germany and the Netherlands have Roxadustat on the market, while most of the countries are negotiating prices and whether it will be covered by the public health care system. In most countries, the availability of Roxadustat is expected during the first half of 2022, or in some countries like, for example, Spain, uh, we expect to have uh, Roxadustat in the market later in 2022. In the UK, Roxadustat is licensed, but it requires the approval by the NICE before uh, being in the market. Hello. 
Uh, Alex, good. Uh, thank you very much. Yeah, wonderful. Um, yeah, Professor Cho, any any uh, thoughts on the Korean side with respect to Roxadustat? Okay, I am uh, Changi Cho from Daegu National University, Korea. Uh, in Korea, Roxadustat passed uh, the Korean FDA last July, but it cannot be used in clinic still still not used because the price is not decided. We uh, expect the price will be set uh, early next year, and it will be available at the time. In my opinion, it's more necessary for dialysis patients because we are encountering ESA resistance in these patients, but it will probably be used first for non-dialysis patients in Korea. That's my uh, thought. Uh, because in non dialysis patients, the dose is probably smaller than dialysis patients, so the price, is, price can be set with relatively small burden over limbers. So we can use uh, that patient to that patient first. If non dialysis patient can be administered orally without injection, the significant demand exists in patients with uh, especially long term follow up period. And I do not have any information about the price of Roxadostat, but regarding the prices, as uh, Nangaku showed uh, in their slide, it seems that it can be used. Uh, it can be used enough if a similar prices to Epoitin or MASP. Although there is a problem of peer burden, it is possible to overcome ESA resistance by taking it only on the day of dialysis. And it can be prescribed to dialysis patient. Uh, Korea, um, Korea also applies bundle pay for dialysis costs, but oral drugs are not included in the pay, like Japan. So it is necessary that the cost of a Roxas stuff should be included in the bundle pay, like ESA, okay. Me. Yeah, yeah, thank you very much. So not yet available, of course, working on pricing and reimbursement issues, but should be by sometime next year. Um, and um, and it sounds as if you anticipate moderate moderate uh, demand uh, in a you know, fair bit of interest in utilization of those uh, the drugs as they become available. Oh, good, thank you. I, I would want to turn, and you noted as well an issue on, on dosing uh, as well, um, uh, which I think is interesting. Uh, um, and this came up actually in, in uh, Professor Zhou's talk as well. But as we think about dosing, I actually wanted to pivot first to uh, Roberto Bacuafijo for some perspective on where we stand in the US, and in particular what the FDA might have, might have thought about his head feedback and guidance from FDA and what they might be expecting in terms of additional da data with Roxadustat and other, and then I'm thinking of other HIPs as they may come come up to the for FDA uh, review. Right. Thanks. Yeah, thanks, Bruce. Um, yeah, so so by, by mid-July, uh, the there was a, a presentation from uh, Fibrogen and uh, AstraZeneca of their full program, trial program, to a, an external independent panel ad, of advisor and a very interesting discussion about the data. There was um, identification of some potential um, relationship between side effects and target hemoglobin and also uh, the dosing of rocks that start used in the in the trials and rate of uh, rate of um, rise of of uh, hemoglobin which was uh, raised by the panel of, of, of advisors. But really the, the final response was actually received by the companies from the FDA um, just a few weeks ago. And that uh, request additional clinical trial data and not exploration of the current data available. And at the moment, the, you know, both Fibrogen and AstraZeneca are evaluating the next steps. I think uh, we haven't really heard what the final decision would be, but definitely new clinical trial data will be um, needed for the resubmission of the process. We also heard that there's, uh, there will be a, 
an, an advisory um, committee meeting uh, later in the year for Varadustad, uh, which already presented their phase three trials in a in um, a couple of New England Journal of Medicine papers a few few weeks ago. And uh, finally, for the Pradustat, in there will be the the presentation of the main results um, of the phase three trials will be presented next week at the ASN in a late breaking clinical trials session. And um, we already heard the top line results um, for the Pradustat too. But um, in terms of regulatory process for that produce that uh, I'm not aware of um, any movement yet. Roberto, yeah, thank you. Yeah, it's so interesting, isn't it? Uh, really very different stance to date uh, on the regulatory, with respect to the regula regulatory um, uh, decisions uh, in the US versus many other locations in the world. So we're likely to see a situation where drug will have been on market in some cases for a couple of years uh, before coming here to the US. Um, uh, so anyway, we've much, much to learn from data outside the US moving forward. Um, for Alex, did you have some additional uh, context regarding where you, what you might think, uh, what, what do you think with respect to Roxanducet uptake once available? Well, I think that uh, uh, according to the EMA assessment report and the results of the phase three trials, first eligible patients will be those with chronic kidney disease not on dialysis, as well as PD patients or incident patients on dialysis. However, according to the EMA, switching a dialysis patient stable with a current ISA to Roxadus that should be evaluated carefully considering the risk and benefits because of a tendency to an increased risk of cardiovascular events and mortality in this setting, especially among those that require higher ISA doses because of the lack of evidence. Also, patients with cancer or adult polycystic kidney disease should cannot be considered as good candidates. With respect to reimbursement challenges, uh, I know that in the Netherlands and Germany, ROXA is available as previously mentioned and fully reimbursed in general. The expectations in Europe will be that they will be fully covered by the public healthcare systems, perhaps with limited indications in some countries. And for sure, price will be an issue, especially when cheaper biosimilars of ISA are available in most countries. We have to wait, I think, for the pharmacoeconomic studies that are on board, including not only direct cost of the drug, but also, for example, the sparing effect on IV iron. Good, right. Yeah, yeah, thank you, Alex. Thank you, Alex. And, and, and with this in mind, and any questions remaining with respect to safety, of course, there, there's a lot that's still unknown with drug uh, uh, that has last recently come on market. Uh, for, for Masayomi, uh, Professor Nangaku, could you just give a comment with respect to the thromboembolic events that you reported in the post marketing uh, safety to date? Is this is there, are there any surprises that you that you see here? Yes, uh, thank you, Bruce, for the question. Uh, I don't think the number is great, considering that many patients were taking roxetostat during the post marketing survey. The issue of the post marketing survey is that we do not exactly know what kind of numbers of the patients were taking the drug and there's no control. But actually, the estimation is that uh, probably about 20,000 patients were taking roxetostat during the post-marketing survey. So 84 of thromboembolic events uh, does not seem too many uh, to me. Thank you. Good, okay, right, right. Um, Exactly. Actually, we're, we're running fairly short on time, and and and, and Masayomi as well. Any concern or, or with respect to uh, you know, the question been raised about rapid rise in hemoglobin? Um, are, are you seeing any concerns about this in relation to safety events? Uh, well, thank you, Bruce. Uh, the speed of the uh, increase of hemoglobin is completely different among uh, diff five different types of drugs, and roxadastat increases hemoglobin very rapidly sometimes. So we are paying special attention to the uh, too rapid increase of hemoglobin when we use roxetostat. Yeah, yeah, indeed, right. And this, I, th I think 
that's so interesting that but speaks specifically to comments from uh, uh, Professor Zhuo uh, as well, who noted uh, that they're often using lower dose uh, than than uh, uh, than labeled. Um, uh, and even the FDA, I think, I think brought this up as an option as well. So maybe a dosing issue on the ROXA uh, side. And any other, for Professor Zhou, any comments in this regard re with respect to dosing of ROXA Dusta? Uh -huh. Oh, sorry, uh, Lee, right now you're muted. Okay, sorry, Lee, we, we're not able to hear you, unfortunately. Bruce, why are we waiting for yeah. Lee on this? May, may I just add, because this was a discussion that came up in, um, in, the, ad, in the FDA AdCom. Um, there was a presentation from the companies at the AdCom uh, showing um, sub-analysis of data uh, or, strat or data stratified by dosing and also by um, Target a hemoglobin, and uh, and there was an idea to expand the, that analysis in a in a using the existing data as a as a potential way of mitigating the you know the risk observed in trials, and uh, which was not accepted ultimately by the FDA, which requested new data. But uh, there was the idea of really you know making an exercise in terms of the reanalysis. Uh, and also observational data um, that could be that could provide information um, that would answer that question. Good. Right, Roberto. Thank you very much, Rice. Just uh, just past time, um, and let's see, uh, Professor Zhuo. It, it sounds as if your your audio is not on right now, and that's totally fine. What we can do is take advantage of our chat function. So we actually have a number of questions that came to us that we've just not had a chance to get to. We knew as we put this session together that we would, <laughs> we'd be short on time and actually may uh, think about ways to, to, you know, to come up with a, a new session in the, in the coming months where we, where we bring you all together again and discuss this in more detail. Because I think we really have an important opportunity here with the DOPS data and involvement in multiple regions around the world as, as the hip beach inhibitors are coming, coming on board. Uh, uh, the really an important opportunity uh, along with expertise that you all bring. So again, we'll continue the uh, discussion uh, uh, through through chat function and, and welcome comments and questions from audience as well. Uh, with this, uh, let's move now to our next segment. All right. Well, good day everybody and 